Welcome to uh, the Cognitive Informatics Seminar. We're very pleased to have Murray Shannon, Shanahan, who is a um, professor of cognitive robotics at Imperial College London and senior scientist at DeepMind. He's worked on artificial intelligence, robotics, logic, dynamical, dynamical systems, computational neuroscience, and philosophy of mind. Until 2000, he was a traditional classic symbolic AI researcher, and then he turned his attention to the brain and its embodiment. His current interests include neurodynamics, consciousness, machine learning, and the impacts of artificial intelligence. And today, he will be speaking to us about animal cognition and artificial intelligence. Welcome, Murray, it's all yours. Um, thank you very much, and thank you very, very much for, uh, for the, uh, the invitation. Um, uh, okay, so uh, oh, yes, I should uh, thank some of my colleagues who've uh, contributed particularly to this sort of line of research that I'm going to, I'm thinking that I'm going to be uh, talking about. Um, so, uh, so, so rather than one of those kind of slides uh, listing, uh, listing, you know, um, what I'm going to be talking about, I, I thought I'd present you with a, a Venn diagram of themes. Um, and uh, so, so I, and, and in, a, in a way, I'm not quite sure what the natural order of the, conceptually speaking of these themes are, but I'm uh, quite convinced that they, uh, that they, uh, you know, intertwine in, in important ways. And the three themes are uh, found foundational common sense, transfer, as in transfer learning, and abstraction. And, um, and I'm interested in, in producing what we sort of now tend to call artificial general intelligence, which is a kind of uh, holy, ho sort of holy grail of AI. Uh, so that's the thing in the middle there. And my view is that, um, uh, is that the, the way to, to get there is, is we really need to, to, to make some kind of breakthroughs in uh, the context of these three themes, foundational common sense, transfer, um, and, uh, and, uh, and abstraction. And so just to be clear, because these terms get uh, you know, thrown around a lot. Uh, so what I mean by uh, artificial uh, general intelligence or AGI is roughly speaking human level AI. Uh, and what I mean by that is roughly speaking the ability to learn to solve a range of tasks as wide as a human being uh, can learn to solve. Uh, and of course, it, it's foolish to try and define a thing like this, uh, hence, it, hence the wavy lines, but uh, that's, that's a, a little approximation to it anyway. Um, okay, so um, uh, so I should give you a heads up that I'm not going to tell you how to solve these things at all. Ra on the contrary, I'm going to be uh, raising a whole lot of problems <laughs> and, um, um, and and describing a whole lot of uh, lot of uh, issues. Um, so the so the sort of the first uh, part of the talk is is um, I'm going to present some experiments in attempting to achieve uh, transfer learning in a kind of straightforward way, which in a sense we didn't really. Uh, didn't really expect that much of it, but it's a, it's a sort of instructive uh, set of experiments. Um, okay, so the context is um, is doing deep reinforcement learning uh, in 3D environments, um, and um, uh, and so so here we see um, a couple of stills from a couple of uh, 3D sort of virtual games-like environments that that have been used to do this sort of thing, um, and on the left is is one of DeepMind's um, environments, this little sort of playroom environment, and uh, and on the right we have um, the animal AI environment that we used at Imperial College to stage this uh, animal AI Olympics competition that I think was uh, uh, mentioned in the abstract. Um, and uh, and the so the really interesting thing that has, that sort of happened in the in the mid 2010s um, was that it, that with the advent of deep reinforcement learning in these 3D environments, uh, then suddenly we were in a position to actually um, put, you know, little sort of simulated agents in situations that are reminiscent of the daily lives of animals. And that meant that we could, ex it could import experimental paradigms um, from the animal cognition literature and use them to, you know, to, to test these, uh, test our, uh, our trained agents to see whether they can, um, whether they can pass these various tests. Um, and, uh, and that was something that wasn't possible before. It wasn't possible before the really the advent of, well, DeepMind's DQN, uh, um, Deep Reinforcement Learning System. So that's the one that learned to play all these Atari games. Uh, and the remarkable thing about, about, about DQN was that 
it took as its input just raw pixels and its output was uh, and a reward signal which is basically the game score and its output was just the sort of the raw uh, uh, game instructions like you get on a games controller or you know up down left right uh, you know space bar um, and uh, and it had no idea you know what any of these things have meant or what they represented it just was raw pixels in raw motor instructions out and it learned to do very very well at all of those games um now so of course uh, that those games are not like the world that we live in but um just a you know a year or so uh, later people were starting to publish um uh, things that involved 3d environments or 3d games or just 3d environments like these where the world is you know a lot more like the one that we inhabit you have a um, an embodied agent that has a point of view on on this 3d world it moves around navigates in this 3d world uh, that contains objects um uh, that uh, have the sorts of broadly speaking the causal properties that objects have in our world that they can Instructions, they can be moved around or not, and, and so on. Um, so that's you know this is an amazing opportunity to do some really uh, interesting uh, experiments and to and to do things from um, that, that are imported from an, an adjacent cognitive science branch of cognitive science. Um, okay, so um, uh, so that's sort of the context. Um, so in uh, so at Imperial College, but sort of building on that idea, we uh, built this. Uh, 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 a, a, this sort of animal uh, or this um, simulated environment that's of, the, of this kind uh, and we ran this uh, animal AI competition and the idea was that we invited teams to, to, to develop agents uh, that were good at maximizing their reward in this world and maximizing reward meant obtaining these green spheres so the idea is that you you can see one in, in this picture that you need to find green spheres and you sort of consume them by rolling over them and then that gives you a, a, a reward and the uh, and the competitors, the teams were basically they were given the code to run this environment, and they were told the kinds of tasks that they would be uh, uh, given. Of course, told that the reward, you know, is basically how many green spheres you get. But the actual test tasks themselves were held out and kept secret. Um, and uh, here's an example of one particular. Uh, task of, uh, that, that we um, uh, held out. So the idea here is that this green sphere is on top of a little pillar. The the the, um, the avatar, the agent can't actually just um, uh, obtain that sphere right away. Rather, it has to knock it off somehow, but it can push that box into the pillar and knock the uh, sphere off that way and thereby obtain it. And, you know, I think not very surprisingly, actually, 0% of the competition entrants solved this problem. Uh, but in a, interestingly, in a, in a separate study, uh, with children uh, in exactly the same environment with exactly the same tasks. So 60% of 10 year olds, 10 year old children solved this task immediately, zero shot. Um, so that's kind of, you know, uh, noteworthy. And, and basically, you know, I think the, 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 uh, take, the takeaway message from that is that humans excel at applying what they've learned from past experience to novel situations. And it's that capability that I really want to try to somehow, you know, replicate. Um, and I think that's what we need to be able to do to get towards uh, AGI, artificial general in intelligence. Um, and we can uh, uh, um, learn a lot from the animal cognition literature in how to, uh, I mean, I, I wish we could learn a lot from the animal cognition literature in exactly how to do this, how to build uh, you know, AI systems that did it. But unfortunately, you, you, know, you can't read that out of the li literature. But what you can import is a lot of experimental paradigms and sort of best practice and, and so on. And, and here we see one particular uh, example of, of animal tool use being, being tested in the animal cognition literature, and it's actually animal tool manufacture and, and tool use. So basically in this uh, setup, there's, a, there's a, a reward item that's only accessible if, um, uh, uh, by the um, by by the rook, if it has a, um, uh, by the, I think it's a crow actually, a crow, not rook. Uh, if it has a, a stick which is long enough to slide out the reward item, um, and the stick has to be long enough, and it, but none of the sticks available are long enough, so it has to kind of manufacture a stick by joining two bits together. Um, and here we see uh, um, one of the tests where it, uh, where it, where it succeeds. And the, one of the key things about this um, is that. Animal cognition researchers very carefully design their experimental paradigms so that they test these, these capacities 
uh, in transfer conditions. So, so if this was, uh, if, if the animal had been trained and was on exactly this situation, uh, then it would be less impressive than if it had, if it had learned in a in, in a uh, sort of a, perhaps similar sorts of situations, but not with exactly the same challenges, and then was able to apply the things that it had learned in those situations to this new situation. And uh, so it's that kind of transfer test, which is the real test that an animal uh, has the cognitive capacity that, that, it, that the experimenters are looking for. And, uh, and that's exactly the sort of thing that I think we should be doing in AI as well. We should be looking for transfer. Um, Okay, so here now, oops, no, let me just, now what we see here, I'll, I'll ask, well, actually, I'll just, I'll, so, so, so this is one of our um, uh, agents in, a, in an environment, and you'll see a similar, uh, it's doing a sort of similar sort of task. So basically, there's a, I'll tell you in advance that you know what to look for. So there's a table, um, and the table uh, has on top of it um, uh, a uh, a box with so with a, with a, a green sphere inside it, so that's the same uh, sort of challenge uh, as we saw in the animal uh, AI case, but this is actually a deep mind test, um, and uh, the uh, but the but it can't reach that without uh, a stick, so uh, we'll just see what it does. So so it knocks the uh, it knocks the the thing off the table. And it flips it over and you have to take my word for it that there's actually a, is one of the rewarding green spheres inside that box and so uh, the box amusingly ends up on its head um but it has in, in doing that has consumed the reward item and got its got its reward so so you know so that looks very impressive right uh but of course there should be a, a really really important question in your mind as soon as you see that and it's the same question that should be in your mind whenever you see any uh, you know, any uh, animal video on Twitter of an animal doing a fancy thing, which was what is the animals, or in this case, the agent's past experience? What has it learned prior to this? Because if it simply learned to perform this task just purely by rote, the exact sort of uh, sequence of, of actions through some kind of reward um, scaffolding, then it's really no achievement. But but if the if the uh, agent or the animal you know has not seen anything quite like this before and has somehow applied and generalized from its past experience then uh, then indeed you know one should be impressed so we'll come in a minute we'll come to um uh, a little be a bit, little bit more precise of the experiments that we've done about this transfer gap the gap between the training set and uh, uh, and and the uh, sort of test sets so sorry. So this this um, slide is just making basically the same point and uh, just a, appealing to a, a classic um, uh, a classic paper in the animal cognition literature from Amanda Seed uh, and et al, including uh, Nikki Clayton, um, uh, where they very clearly sort of define the transfer conditions um, uh, in in this uh, trap tube uh, for this trap tube uh, test. Okay. So now I'm going to show you. Um, uh, uh, a, a sort of more rigorous study of the kind of thing that, that you uh, that leads up to the sort of thing that you just saw uh, and uh, again I'll give you a heads up that ultimately it's not going to be very impressive um, uh, you know when we look into it um, okay so the idea is that uh, is that we're going to uh, be looking at certain uh, training tasks um, so our agent in this 3d environment is going to be um, uh, is going to uh, train on, on a certain set of tasks and then test it on a different set of tasks. So these are the tasks that it's that in this first case that it's going to be trained on. So the at the apple or the green sphere in the in the one case um, is uh, behind this uh, um, this screen, so it can't see it and it has to sort of look for it. In the second case, um, the the apple is uh, is in this box, so it, it has to get it out of the box uh, before it can get to it. And in the third case, the apple is under the table, so it has to uh, sort of reach under the table in order in order to get to it. So those are three training tasks, and here are four held out tasks. So the idea is to train on the three previous tasks and then to test on these uh, four variations. So these four variations combine aspects of the tasks that we've seen before. So in this case, the apple uh, is inside the box and behind the panel. And in this case, the apple is under the table and behind the panel. In this case, the apple is inside the box and the box is under the table. And here we have one where all three things uh, are, are, are hold the, the apples inside the box and under the table and behind this, uh, this screen. 
Um, and a cre an absolutely crucial thing here um, is that in the tra during training and indeed during test testing, um, we make sure that there is procedural variation. So procedural variation is just uh, just means that the term really comes from the games uh, um, in industry, um, but it basically means just randomizing, randomized uh, trials that are randomized in various ways. Um, so in particular, um, a tr well, trials and and not just trials, but 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 um, training conditions that are randomized in lots of different ways. So um, so so the the different tasks that you uh, that you saw, it doesn't just um, uh, you know when it's training, it doesn't just um, try with exactly the same setup each time, but rather it's trained on procedurally varied um, versions of each setup. So in particular, for each object, um, you, we vary the color and the size and the aspect ratio, the material. Um, the texture and position orientation, the room itself, we vary the size of the room and the wall height and the colors and the lighting. And we also uh, vary where the uh, the avatar, the, the agent is uh, sort of spawned uh, and the size of the, the rewarding apple. And so all of these things are all just, are all uh, randomized, uh, both during training and during testing. Um, uh, now this is actually rather tricky, by the way. So I just uh, have a little slide on, on on that. So you can't just, in order to make this sort of thing work, you can't just vary sizes and locations uh, randomly. So this is a kind of a, like a technical challenge, but I'm just drawing attention to it for your uh, interest. So for example, in that uh, apple is under the table condition, you can't, you know, the, the apple has to be under the table, but not out of reach and not too big to fit given the height of the table. So you can't you know, randomly shrink the table and randomly you know, uh, blow up the apple to be much bigger at the same time. You have to kind of make sure that all these constraints hold collectively. So it just makes the whole business of this procedural variation rather tricky from a technical point of view. Uh, I'm just mentioning that because it's a pain in the neck. <laughs> um, Okay, so here are some experimental results, and we uh, and different sort of time limits where um, uh, where the the the, the uh, agent has different kind of amounts of time to try and get hold of uh, of the apple. So remember, there are these four conditions. Uh, so the apple is uh, th so these are the held out tasks. So it hasn't seen these exact conditions in training. So the apple is inside the box and behind the wall and so on. Uh, now, note particular in particular this one of the uh, apple uh, is inside the box and under the table because we'll see some videos of that in a second. Um, so, okay, so oh well, so we know we know first of all we notice that that, that if the apple is inside the box and behind the the panel, uh, then it actually does really really well. So, adding the panel into the mix really doesn't make very much difference. So it doesn't get tricked by that. It just kind of goes around the panel and. Um, uh, and and then you know flips over the box and 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 gets it. So, but it's you know let's be honest, this isn't much of a transfer gap. This isn't much of a challenge. Just just putting that uh, wall there. So you know we'd be particularly disappointed if it hadn't done that. But this one is interesting. So Apple is uh, being inside the box and under the table. And here we see well you know, okay, it's getting it. It's it's managing to get the uh, um, uh, get the the Apple. Uh, you know thirty four. 35% of the time. So, you know, hey, you know, that's, that's, uh, that's not bad. Um, you know, it's, it, it's, it's got a kind of, uh, it, you know, intuitively, you might think that it's got to be able to combine two, you know, elements of what it's learned before, two of the different conditions, um, both how to deal with boxes and how to deal with things that are under the, the table. Table, the table sort of you know, way. Um, so five percent of the time, it's managed to put those two things together and it succeeded. But let me tell you that this is highly misleading. We'll see why in a second. Um, so okay, so the so the agents generalize well to just you know adding the wall. They don't generalize um, uh, so well to the box and the table. But but hey, you know that's not bad, right? Uh, and you know you think this is something to work on. Then. But okay, let's see what actually happens. So so this is um, uh, one of the uh, so this is just one. Uh, uh, test condition so and this is one of the ones where it succeeds so one of the 35 percent so let's just have a little watch and so it's so it's sort of it's got the thing out and you know don't forget it's never seen this combination of things before and unfortunately it was slightly out of view but you can see that it successfully flipped the box over and the little green sphere came out and it consumed the little green sphere well okay now let's have a look at this other one now hope now i wonder if you, if if you can uh, guess what's really going on here 
well, let me tell you, I mean, I'll tell you what's really going on here, uh, is, that the, uh, uh, is that it's simply doing what it does whenever it sees boxes. It, has, it doesn't care about, at all about the fact that there's a table uh, there. Um, and it just gets lucky because basically it, if you just attempt to flip the box over, um, uh, you know, again and again and again, eventually because of the, the physics, it will kind of, it, it's or not, not always, but you know, sort of about 35% of the time, eventually uh, it, just jiggling it around like that will mean that the thing will eventually pop out from under the table and then will indeed flip over. So in fact, uh, even those 35% are just, uh, there's no real understanding of kind of what's, or no real transfer applying its, you know, what it had to um, do to get things out from under the table. It's just really not, it's just ignoring the table. In fact, it's just kind of going for the box and trying to flip it over very persistently. And so it's going to get lucky uh, occasionally. Um, okay. Um, so here's a more, uh, uh, so, so here's a, a more, uh, sort of complex setup. So in this case, there are there are nine different training tasks, and this one, uh, uh, you know, is, involves a bit of tool use. Um, so so again, there's going to be some training tasks, and there are going to be some test uh, tasks. So uh, so our training tasks, well, we've seen this combination before. The the, the ball is in the box under the table. Uh, we haven't seen on the table before. Now now in the box and under the table is now a training task, not a test task. We also have one where the box, uh, where the ball is in the box and on the table. Uh, here's one where the ball is on the table but out of reach. Now, previously, uh, when the the ball was under the table, it was within reach of the the um, of the the avatar could reach out and, and and take it. Oh, by the way, I should have mentioned that the the avatar has a sort of invisible tractor beam of a certain length that it that it can use to pick things up. Um, um, so, uh, but it's a fixed length, so it can't, you know, it can, it can only reach certain things. So in this case, the, this, the, uh, the, the ball is, is, is out of reach, but there's a stick that it can use to knock the, uh, knock the ball off. In this case, analogously, analogously the um, uh, ball is out of reach under the table, but it can use the stick to knock it out. This is an easy version where the stick is right next to the, uh, um, uh, to the, Ball, another easy version where the stick is right next to the ball, and these ones are used to kind of uh, to scaffold the learning um, uh, with a bit of sort of you know reward uh, shaping sc to, to, to scaffold the learning, um, uh, and and that enables it to kind of learn the more complex task um, uh, you know in, in in a reasonable time. Um, but of course, all of these things are are, are being learned. Uh, you know, they're, they're being learned by rote. So we're not we don't want to test on any of these conditions. Rather, we want to test on a transfer condition. So this is the transfer test we're going to use, which is combining you know a lot of those other things, where the ball is in a box and on a table uh, and uh, out of reach. Now this, of course, is the condition, the, the exact condition that you saw in the um, uh, in the uh, uh, the original video that I that I showed you. Um, so which, just to remind you, the agent has encountered boxes on tables. It's encountered uh, things that are out of reach but can be moved with sticks before. But it's never seen this combination of an out of reach box, um, uh, nor has it ne ever needed to move a box uh, with a stick, uh, indeed. So, you know, so we would expect us to be able to sort of uh, solve this kind of thing. And, you know, if you're expecting me to say, hey, you know, we can solve these kinds of problems. No, I'm going to give you the exact opposite. Uh, conclusion that we, these kinds of things, you know, remain uh, very tricky. So, um, so this is the success rate. Uh, so on the training task, we managed to get it so that it can perform all those training tasks to 100%. You know, that's that's with uh, all the procedural variation we uh, 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 we we throw at it. So incidentally, when uh, uh, even when we're um, to get this figure on the training tasks, we're still introducing procedural variation. So it, it's unlikely even for this 100% for it to have seen the exact combination of colors, sizes, and so on for any of any of the uh, tasks that it got to this 100% uh, for. But they're all the same tasks though. Uh, but these are the, uh, are the sort of two transfer conditions. Um, I mean, the one uh, in particular we focused on was, was in the box and on the table and out of reach. And there, you know, an absolutely pathetic uh, success rate, um, just five percent. And in, indeed, uh, I I was uh, honest under the video that original first video where it succeeded. That was one of the five percent cherry picked. Um, so uh, so a kind of conclusion. So um, 
uh, well, a few conclusions. So, so, so a few bits, sort of summary uh, conclusions. So, so, okay, the obvious one is that achieving uh, this kind of transfer, you know, turns out to be very difficult. Um, on the other hand, humans are really pretty good at this this kind of thing. I don't have any doubt that any of us here would have just solved this problem right away. And and our ten year olds, they didn't solve this exact one, but they solved it in an analogous one. Um, you know, most of them solved it zero shot. Um, uh, a, a little methodological uh, point along the way is that, I, the, is that I do think that this is exactly the kind of way we should be testing things, lifting uh, the best practice from the animal cognition literature. We should be testing things in transfer conditions and not uh, testing on the training set, as is still often uh, often done in, in reinforcement learning. And even I count this, even though these procedural variations are, may not have been encountered in training, um, that is still training, uh, testing on the training set, as far as I'm concerned, because the tasks don't differ substantially. Um, okay, so uh, so we've got before, this. Um, before what you, I call this. Before you go uh, on, there's just uh, um, Mary. There's just trans one question. Mary, yeah, yeah. There's a yep. question from uh, Pierre Vernet about what actions, or perhaps you already answered it briefly. What actions are pre-programmed in the avatar? So what's how big is their record? Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the so the actions uh, um, uh, are, are extremely low level. So it's just it's just one uh, step, and one uh, so so one um, step in the environment is in kind of uh, you know in human uh, time is a fraction of a second, and the actions are basically just uh, just for motion. They're just sort of uh, you know uh, um, just uh, forward um, rotate left and right. Uh, I think you can have combinations of those things, actually. I think that's part of the basic repertoire. So, you know, just, just forward one step, um, rotate left or rotate right one, one you know, increment. Uh, and similarly, there's this invisible um, uh, um, tractor beam that I mentioned, and that can be positioned that it's got, uh, I think, um, just two degrees of freedom, and, uh, and, and and there again, it's just uh, it's just tiny temporal increments. It can go up a little bit, you know, left a little bit, up a little bit, and so on. Um, and there's a pick up and put down, um, or, or, or uh, actually, that's not quite right. It's it's a it's a turn on the tractor beam to pick things up, and a and a turn off to kind of let go as if it was sort of magnetic. Uh, but they're very 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 low level. So it's take it it actually takes literally billions of um, steps for it to learn. To do things in this kind of smooth way that you that you've seen. So so in fact, I mean, let me. I shouldn't be. I shouldn't be so negative about this. So the fact that it can do any of this stuff at all is, you know, is 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 pretty amazing. It's not the kind of thing that we, you know, could have imagined seeing um, ten years ago. So uh, so, but you know, it's a long way from AGI. Um, yeah. Okay. So so how do we try? How do we uh, try and improve this so that we can kind of try and maybe cross this transfer gap uh, a bit. A bit uh, uh, to some extent. Well, I think there, are, you know, we need to we need a two pronged attack. Um, so, for sure, one of the things that we need to, would need to do is to, uh, you know, in line with the whole kind of zeitgeist in AI at the moment. You know, it's all about data um, and scaling, and we've seen that that's you know data and more data and uh, scaling the compute is uh, is an extremely powerful thing to do, and and so there's no doubt that we need to do that. And in in in, in reinforcement learning, that means having like more and more and more tasks, more and more and more variations. So ideally, it, we'd like to see a much larger repertoire of assets with richer affordances and much larger scale procedural generation and training over you know longer periods of time with all, all that. Variation. So that I think that's a, that's an essential thing, and of, you know, of course, if we think about um, uh, human, uh, you know, children or, or infants um, doing doing these sorts of uh, uh, children doing these sorts of puzzles, then there's the benefit of an enormous amount of experience, both uh, both in the in the developmental lifetime of that um, of that. Uh, you know, a child, or 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 the to some extent of the animal, if it's a non-human animal, and you know the benefit of of evolutionary time as well. Uh, so that so there's an awful lot of experience that has you know been brought to bear to get to the point where um, children or animals can solve these sorts of problems. So so you know we, we, we you know we need to do all of that. But there's also the question of architecture. So is the architecture are the architectures that we've got at the moment good enough to do uh, to solve these problems, even given all of the, that, that data, uh, and I think the answer is no. So just to, just a very 
just a, a few very quick notes on the actual architecture that, that, that was used there. So that is, um, so it's a deep reinforcement learning uh, architecture. It's, um, uh, it's a, it's, it's a so-called VMPO architecture. It does a poly, policy gradient uh, architecture um, with uh, an, uh, an LSTM um, layer and, uh, and so on. It's a kind of standard um, agent architecture that's been very successful in lots of the sorts of work that we've done and is the kind of thing that a lot of people have been uh, working on. Now, I don't think that just simple variations of that sort of architecture, just scaling up the architecture or just a few you know, minor bells and whistles or tweaks is going to uh, enable us to solve these sorts of problems. Now, that's you know, that's not a that opinion is not universally held by any means. So so uh, some, uh, you know, kind of data fundamentalists, as I think of them, think that, that we've got a general enough general purpose enough learning uh, architecture to solve uh, most of what we want to solve anyway. And it's just a matter of enough data. But I mean, I don't I tend to not agree with that. And I think the key ingredient that we don't really know how to do uh, properly yet is abstraction. We don't know how to learn um, sufficiently high level abstractions from raw data. Um, and so sort of the next bit of the talk is just to um, uh, to try and pin down what's missing a bit. And, uh, you know, I don't have any answers and I'd love to hear people's uh, su suggestions for this, but uh, but I'm just going to try and pin down what's missing. Uh, okay, so a few sort of, um, you know, it, it, this is a little bit, it's a sequence of sort of sound bites. <laughs> um, so, uh, so I, you know, but I will expand on the sound bites a bit. So, um, okay, so this is sort of summarizing what, what we're, we've got to so far. So, uh, you know, I do think that transfer is the hallmark of intelligence. I mean, transfer, um, uh, I've, I've alluded to this idea of a transfer gap, and, I, and, and so that can be small or large, and humans are amazingly good at crossing very large transfer gaps and applying uh, you know, the expertise they've acquired in one domain to solve tasks from a very different domain. But our best agents fall far short of, of, of human level, and I think abstraction is the key to closing the gap, along with all the scaling up and the data as well. You have to have that. Um, okay, so let's try and sort of unpack this you know what's missing in terms of learning abstractions. So, th so the way I see it is that um, seeing, uh, and, and I should uh, acknowledge that this, uh, um, uh, uh, th th there's a paper in this year's uh, IJKAI, um, which is co-authored with Melanie Mitchell. So we we sort of co-authored this paper together, and this is material that largely from that paper. Um, uh, so. Um, uh, so, the, so the, you know, the, so the idea is that seeing similarity is really the basis of abstraction, um, and by that I mean identifying certain respects in which a one thing, a state, or a sequence is like another, and concluding that they are alike in certain other respects. And seeing similarity among a set of things uh, underlies conceptual uh, abstraction, and so we, we really want to be able to form these conceptual abstractions from raw data, uh, uh, you know, that uh, in the kind of setup that we've seen uh, before. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, so forming a, um, uh, so, so, so seeing that similarity among a set of uh, things means forming a concept of which those things are all instances and seeing that something is an instance of a concept so formed and then applying the concept to, to infer uh, something new about that thing. Now, I just, so, so I'm, I'm interested in kind of this idea of, of learning these sorts of concepts. So I'm going to try and pin that down a little bit more and why it's difficult in, in, in AI. But, you know, an immediate word of caution here, because because uh, suddenly I'm implying these philosophically, I'm, I'm using a philosophically contentious uh, uh, um, words. Um, so, so what do I mean by forming a concept and applying a concept? So, you know, are concept, concepts, uh, you know, actual computational entities? Are they distinct structures in memory? Is that what, I'm, what I've got in the back of my mind? Or are they implicit in a network's parameters? Well, I'm actually, I want to be completely neutral about these sorts of questions. So, you know, are they, I mean, are they theoretical entities like electrons whose existence is just backed by empirical evidence, but, uh, but they're not, you know, they don't have a counterpart in the actual architecture. You know, I don't know. So here, I'm not, I'm not committing to any of that right now. Um, so I'm just speaking of them as a convenient shorthand for certain systematic patterns of intelligent uh, behavior. And the challenge is to find mechanisms that will realize uh, that sort of behavior. Um, so here I want to kind of draw attention to this whole, um, uh, uh, so remember I had this little sort of trinity of things in the, right at the beginning, foundational common sense, transfer and abstraction. And I want to, to now talk about uh, 
start talking about foundational common sense and its role in abstraction. Um, okay, so the key thing about, about concepts is that, or an abstract concept, is that the dom domain of a concept's application has to be larger than the domain of its acquisition. So that's really what we're, what we're looking for. And the larger and more diverse the domain of a concept's application is, compared to the domain of its acquisition, the wider the transfer gap it enables the agents uh, to, to cross. And here we get to the whole thing about foundational common sense. So the concepts with the widest application belong to what I call foundational common sense, which encompasses things like just objects and places and paths and obstructions, uh, portals and containers, parts and holes, journeying and carrying and opening and breaking things apart and joining things together and, and so on. So really, really fundamental things that we acquire um, uh, in infancy. And the really uh, important thing is that, and especially if we think about the longer term goal of trying to build AGI, then is, is that uh, found the, this layer of foundational common sense uh, underpins multiple levels of abstraction. So it's simultaneously kind of concrete and grounded and, uh, uh, and low level and abstract and generic and high level because it's acquired through low level sensory motor interaction with the world uh, you know, as, a, uh, uh, as an infant. Um, and it can be, a, and, and, and maybe you know, to some extent there's, a, there's an uh, evolutionary, you know, um, legacy, evolution, evolutionary um, you know, inheritance of, of certain uh, sort of prior co concepts there. And I'm not committing to how much of that there is or anything. Um, uh, but, it, it is, but it's basically acquired through low level sensory motor interaction with the world, but, and, and, and certainly can be applied at that level. Um, but it can also be applied at the highest levels of abstraction as well, like in art and literature and mathematics, physics and philosophy. So, I've, so I'm, I'm, very, I'm very much a fan of the work of George Lakoff, for example, and, and, uh, and, and colleagues where, uh, as in you know, this classic book from the 80s, Metaphors We Live By, uh, really kind of makes this point very forcefully. And, I've, and I think there's a lot that's right about, about that. Um, so I'm interested in, you know, in acquiring uh, somehow acquiring the, these foundational common sense concepts. And just to, to, just to sort of bring the point at home about how important that is, um, uh, I, I just want to draw attention to some of the sorts of tests that we often see uh, being used as, as really gold standard tests of, of, uh, of, you know, of abstract, of understanding of abstract concepts, or of, of abstraction and analogy and analogical reasoning and so on. We see them in uh, psychology and in, in AI. Um, uh, uh, and here are sort of three classic ones on the left. So, well, it's, 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 so uh, yeah, classic. I, I, I mean, uh, Francois Cholet's uh, arc uh, problems uh, are kind of a recent classic, if you like, like and, and uh, uh, nobody really knows how to solve them very, very, very well. Um, but um, uh, but the idea is that uh, is that uh, is that you're given. Um, Actually, let's not go into details of any of these things. So the, the, um, so the second one down is Bongard problems, which a lot of people would be very familiar with. The idea is that you have to kind of find similarities among these, among each of these pictures, and they're at a quite uh, conceptual level. And finally, Raven's progressive matrices, the same kind of thing. You have to find at a conceptual level the things that are in common between the different kind of rows and columns and so on to guess what was going to appear in the missing square in the bottom right. Um, and so, uh, so people use these as sort of tests of, of, of uh, uh, well, the bottom two, you know, as tests of intelligence in, 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 in humans. Um, and in the top one, it's meant to be a test of, of, of uh, abstraction for AI, but of course, you, you know, humans can, can try these out as well, and they're quite interesting and fun, uh, Francois Cholet's uh, arc problems. But, it re but the key thing is that when people um, try to solve these things on the left uh, in AI, well, they train them on very similar sorts of things. So the tra so even if they're successful, uh, it doesn't impress me that much because the transfer gap that humans solve is much, much, much bigger. And the transfer gap that humans solve is between what we see on the right and what we see on the left. So what we see on the right is the infant learns, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, what um, 
uh, learns this sort of uh, um, you know, core knowledge, as, as Liz Belke uh, calls many of these things, it learns, the, learns this foundational common sense at a very young age. So it learns a repertoire of these really basic concepts, so you know, objects and paths and obstructions and portals and so on, and then can apply those to solve these problems on the left. Now that's real transfer, and 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 that's really what we kind of want to look for. So we want to look, we want somehow to acquire, be able to acquire abstractions from low level sensory motor interaction of the sort that the infant is doing all the time, but that are so low level that they can be applied, uh, you know, in this, in, you know, in these very, very different settings indeed. And of course, there is a big role for, lang for language in all of this, and that's a whole discussion, but I'm not going to go there at the moment, because I think that, um, that pre, you know, pre-linguistic uh, infants already and other animals, uh, you know, already uh, acquire um, a lot of what I'm talking about, and we don't know how to do it in, in AI. That's kind of absolutely uh, kind of uh, key. Um, okay, so I think I'm going to kind of uh, uh, go through the remaining slides reasonably quickly so that we can sort of go to some some questions. But can I ask okay, you so a question? Uh, can I ask yeah. you a question? Uh, yeah, just in, in in could you go back one? Uh, are you saying that the means that you provide to your to your avatars um, in the examples that you showed earlier are the same means with which this foundational common sense or foundational uh, knowledge or capacity is gained or by some other means? Oh, uh, so... Um... So do you mean you mean in, in, in what we've done already or in what we want to do? Well, both, but conceptually, you're using re reinforcement learning as your as the as the mechanism that that produces whatever successes you do get from your avatars. Are yeah, you yeah. are you imagining that the foundational uh, I mean the, the original basic knowledge that the baby has is acquired with those same things, but just acquired early, and then the rest of it is just a matter of ramifying that yeah yeah okay yeah yeah um so so okay so 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 i mean hopefully it's clear that the that you know if, if your question was about you know what we'd already done then the answer is a great big no you know we certainly we have certainly haven't provided the, the means to do this in any way shape or form because we, there's nowhere near enough experience that the agent is exposed to for a start um and uh nor uh nor do i think the architecture is and this pertains to the, i think you know the your larger question, the sex sort of, uh, nor do I think that the, the architecture is adequate for doing it, even if we did, you know, uh, expose it to, or, you know, as much an analogous amount of experience as an, as an infant uh, has. Um, uh, and, you know, in a sense, that's what I'm sort of getting to is, is how can we, um, uh, you know, what, what, what's missing, right, in the architecture to learn abstractions. Uh, now, but, but I think you were also asking, do I, so do I think like reinforcement learning is, 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 is uh, a good foundation for this at all? Um, and there I'm inclined to think um, that, that if you take reinforcement learning um, in, in, in its largest sense, uh, then uh, yes, I do. And, and um, uh, and then it, it, you know it certainly has to en encompass uh, you know so in order to maximize your your expected reward over over time and le to learn how to do that you know that's it's going to encompass doing an awful lot of just pure curiosity driven play and so on because that's ultimately how you're going to maximize your reward by learning about the world and building a model of the world so so long as your notion of reinforcement learning embraces um, you know learning about the world itself. And building a model of the world, which I think it can. Um, uh, perhaps that's where I part company from from Gary Marcus, for example, uh, and and agree with Jan Lecun. So you know the, the answer there would be yes. I'm, I, th I think deep reinforcement learning in its largest conceptual compass is 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 is, is enough. Does does that does that does that answer the, the question yes, you had in mind? Yes, you answered. Thank you. Uh, yeah, well, well ho hopefully, hopefully it does. <laughs> um, uh, okay, um, so um, okay, so so moving on. So we, you know, so I think that we need learning mechanisms uh, that can distill experience uh, into abstractions uh, whose domain of application vastly exceeds their domain of acquisition. So I've said this already, and um, 
Uh, oh, in fact, I've, yes, I've, I think I've sort of said all of that too. Okay, so what kinds of things do we really want to learn now? As and 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 you know, I'm really kind of getting to the end of my talk, so I don't know how to do this, right? But a few kind of uh, um, sound bites to characterize it. So well, the kind of thing that we want. So I think that good abstractions are templates, and uh, tem and and by the way, this uh, immediately alludes to a whole load of things that were were. Um, studied in, you know, extensively in the ancient history, in the ancient past of, of, of artificial intelligence, like Minsky's frames and uh, uh, Roger Shank's uh, scripts and all kinds of things like that, like that, you know, sort of were a bit like this. But of course, nobody knows or knew and nobody still knows now how to learn those things from raw sensory data and raw sort of experience. You can hand engineer them, but that's, that's you know, that's, that's a, you know, I, I hesitate to use such a phrase, but it's a kind of failed research program to try and hand engineer those things. Um, okay, so the idea is we want to learn these things from raw data, but so templates. So, uh, I, so what I mean by template is a, is a representation of a stereotypical pattern of objects, and relations uh, and events. And critically, they've got to include slots or variables that can be filled by or bound to any thing. That's where the abstraction really comes, gains its power, um, is to be able to kind of um, superimpose a template on, you know, any sort of situation and any level of abstraction. So, so um, and then pattern completion then is the basic form of inference over these abstractions. So filling in, so part of the template is sort of given and, and the rest is inferred or, or filled in. So, I mean, this is, uh, uh, and so I should emphasize that this is, uh, you know, these are, these are sort of, this is a bit of a just so story. And so apologies for that, because I don't know how really how to do this, but this is gesturing in the direction I think that we really not want to do. Um, now that what's in the red box is really important. I'm not suggesting hand coding any of this because we can, we could do that, right? That's what they did back in the, they did that back in the seventies. But what we need to do is we need to be able to learn things like this from raw data. Um, so here's an example of a kind of, the kind of thing we might want to uh, to learn is sort of a template for you know this really uh, low level kind of common sense concept part of foundational common sense of just the, a template just for going to x and it has a number of slots like the actor involved and the origin and the destination and a little micro narrative the you know the actor starts off at the origin and departs and then approaches the destination and arrives and then they're at the destination and so on and this you know pattern um, is the kind of this template, you know, it just arises all the time in everyday life and uh, all kinds of levels of abstraction. And, uh, you know, if you read a, a news story or a philosophy essay, and, you know, as again, George Lakoff has pointed out very, very uh, well, um, you know, we find these basic sorts of uh, templates and patterns there just all the time and you know we want to be able to learn things like that and then be able to apply them in very different circumstances um, so there is you know a lot of relevant work uh, you would think out there in the literature and I haven't actually provided the references here but the but the associated Ichikai paper has a lot of references so if you want the actual references then take a look at the uh, the, the Ichikai paper but there's lots of relevant work on analogy and structure mapping uh, on in, in the context of kind of of deep learning and deep reinforcement learning there's lots of work on uh, the latent spaces and are trying to uh, uh, get deep RL and, uh, and deep learning in general to learn more abstract latent spaces. But whenever we see the word more abstract in, um, in the description, you know, in one of those papers, then you always find that what they mean by more abstract is in a such a, such a narrow, narrow, narrow context. That it doesn't count as abstract as an abstraction in the sense that I'm alluding to at all. Um, you know, it's not something that can be applied in a completely different setting. Um, so, but anyway, there's a lots of, of work you might think was, was relevant, stuff on associative memory, I think is potentially very relevant. It's all discussed in the Ichikai paper, if you want to uh, look at it in more detail. Um, abstraction through language, I haven't talked about language at all, and it's obvious that we, uh, that we um, uh, you know, leverage language um, a, a great deal to achieve uh, uh, abstraction. So that's all, um, you know, obviously very important. But none of and, and there's on oh, those uh, and I should emphasize there's there's some really good work you know it, recent work in the in the deep reinforcement learning uh, literature on uh, doing abstraction through language. Um, 
But none of it achieves the sort of abstraction that I've been talking about here and the sort of abstraction we would need to cross those sorts of transfer gaps, even the sort of simple ones that we saw before, let alone the kind of thing that we humans uh, cross when we apply the concept of a journey to, uh, um, you, know, you know, to life itself uh, in, a, in a poem or something. Um, Okay, so, so, so what are the fundamental research, so here just, this is my last slide, so what are the fundamental research challenges that, 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 we're, that we really need to look at there? So, um, so there, there are these sort of really three important ones. So one is to do with discreteness and dif differentiability. So there's a kind of tension between trying to make um, uh, architectural components that are end-to-end -end differentiable, which is what you need in order to make something that can be part of a deep, deep learning uh, framework. Um, uh, so making them, the tension is between making things differentiable and, and the discreteness that you need for the sorts of representations that, that we're talking about. These templates, you know, have to have kind of discrete parts and things that can be, you know, the variables and the things that can be bound to them. You need, there needs to be a kind of discreteness there. And there's a lot of, you know, relevant work on that, but it's very much an open problem. Uh, discovering objects and relations. So it's natural to think that objects and relations are are a sort of fundamental level of structure that you would want uh, that you would want in your representations, and, the, and that uh, you know you want to carve the world up into objects, relations, and and and, and events, and so on. Um, and again, that's an open problem. How you learn all of that from scratch? Again, the thing, the th important thing is learning it from the raw uh, data and not engineering it in advance. Um, and finally, variable binding. So, uh, in order, you, you, this is an absolutely key thing that you need to be able to have variables in your representation that can be bound to any thing. And variable binding in the context of deep learning is another unsolved problem. Although, again, there are a few, you know, uh, sort of pointers to the kind of thing that we might might want to do. Um, so that is my uh, last slide, and I'll leave you with um, three of the kind of uh, most relevant uh, papers that and um, and. Uh, yeah, uh, I'll take more more questions. Thank you very much, uh, Murray.